<laughs> Welcome to the next episode of Breaking Ground. I'm Steve Kliegerman, and I'm honored to be with this expert panel today. First of all, happy 10th anniversary, Vince Rocco. Wow. wow. It's been That's 10 awesome. years since you started your Talking New York Real Estate, and I'm yeah. so honored to be with you on this date. It's amazing, and can't wait to hear what we all have to say. Yeah. Welcome to Candace and Melissa. Uh, you guys just had your how many episodes? Your 12th episode. That's amazing. And you've had some incredible guests, and I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say today. That and last guest they had was phenomenal. You yeah, well, you know, that you know, you know, that, that Heim guy. <laughs> and we've got he Greg uh, from that, crossing the line. And, and we've got Greg everywhere. Heim, who always crosses the line <laughs> and is crossing the line right now, in, in, interrupting my introduction. But, Greg, it's great to have you here. It's also great to see is. that everyone's got their mug here, except for me. Yeah. Mug um, so I'm going to have to have a mug for my ne next episode. Just don't put your mug on it, get it? Ah, ha, ha, very <laughs> funny. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're here today to talk a little bit about the first quarter, what we see going on for the rest of the year, and in general, how our shows are going. And, and really, Vince, you know, coming from, you know, the, the uh, leader here in starting shows, you know, tell us a little bit first about how did you come up with your show? Because your show really is the genesis of all of our shows. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. That's great to As have As I said in my post last night, you are my hero <laughs> uh, on so many different levels uh, in, in, in real estate here. Um, you know, Talking New York Real Estate first started as Good Morning New York Real Estate uh, on the Voice America Network, and it was live for seven years. Um, and that was a little daunting at first, not knowing how to do that. You know, one day I just woke up and said, um, I just want to do this. I, I kind of studied broadcasting and teaching and a whole bunch of things in college, and I thought, you know, I didn't make it as a broadcaster. <laughs> well, you did. It just took a little time. Yeah, well, I was going to say, <laughs> so it took many years later, and I just I got a phone call one day out of nowhere and was recruited, and the guy on the phone said, the producer said um, from Voice America, we would like you to do a podcast, and I kind of thought and said, I'm going to sound stupid here, but what the hell is a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no idea, Okay. He said, do you listen to radio? And I said, I do. I used to. I don't drive too much anymore because I live in the city. But um, anyway, long story short, they signed me to a 13-week contract, which turned into a year, which turned into seven years. Um, and I just figured it out. You know, I was in the business a while, uh, you know, and knew a lot of people um, and knew a lot of stuff. And I just decided to talk about it, you know, once a week with lots of guests. You were on the show many times. Um, and then it morphed into uh, Talking New York Real Estate here on the Moore Network, which has really blown up all of a sudden, uh, I think maybe because of the, the YouTube aspect of it. Same concept, uh, our show, lots of agents, lots of specialists, lots of you know experts. Mr. Hein here, in, in addition to you, have been on the show as Candace As have Candace and Melissa. This beautiful set here at Studio 1873 is brought to you by the Everset. The Everset provides full-service staging and furniture rental solutions in the New York area. We work with Brown Harris Stevens and many other top real estate firms, staging their homes to sell quickly and at the highest price possible. Our staging is affordable without sacrificing quality or design. For more information, please visit us at staging.theeverset.com or email us at staging.theeverset.com to request a free proposal. Correct. And so it, it's fun. At this point, it's just fun. It's a lot of work, but I just love every minute of it. All right. and, and you make it so much fun. And, and thank you for kind of opening that all up for all of us, because if I don't think if you hadn't brought your show to the studio, I don't think we would have shows. Yeah. And, and, and thank you. you know, and it's been great to watch you. And now it's been great to watch Candace and Melissa yeah. with the build up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've had some amazing, amazing guests, you know, it's a great in, concept. In, in, in addition to being amazing brokers and incredible business people. <clears throat> how did you come up with the concept for your show and differentiating it from all the other shows? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, you know, financial literacy is very important, right? We've been in the business for so long, <laughs> about 10 years now, and, you know, we had to learn the hard way, right? And a lot of our clients, especially first-time home buyers, 
they don't have that information. They don't have that quality of information. You see, you know, a lot of content on the stock market, but there is this gap in real estate and how to invest in real estate to build wealth, hence to build up, build up your wealth, <laughs> right? Um, so Candace and I got to talking and we'd always been doing this. You know, we had Greg during the pandemic on our webinar, um, but we wanted to reach a broader audience, right? And so we started coming up with the idea of the podcast. Um, and I think, Candace, you can talk a little bit about our guest and, you know, the concept of the show. Yes. Thank you, Steve, again for having us. So um, what differentiates the buildup is that we interview real estate investors from all different backgrounds of life. And the goal is really to not only highlight how people who may not already have been in real estate, they might have found success as a performer, professional athlete, or maybe a chef or a tech founder, you know, people who don't know real estate. Um, like many of our listeners, you know, are not in real estate. So showing how people who didn't come from that background can make a successful investment portfolio in the in the industry, and also to highlight how each investor utilizes a different type of investing. Right, not being a landlord is not for everybody. It's you know usually what people think of when you think of investing in real estate. But some people really need a more passive form, like investing in a REIT, right? And so what is that? And trying to highlight that and explain that, and or opportunity zones. Like there's so many ways you can build wealth through real estate. And we really just want to educate our audience on, you know, the different ways so they can better figure out what's the right fit for them. I love that. I also love how you've kind of melded investment with your new development background as well. So kind of the buildup is a conglomeration of both of those things, yes. right? And, and you know, bringing that experience and bringing both your resale and new development experience to the table, I, I think, is, is a unique way to expose the public to our business. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, we want to kind of give our audience, you know, a faster learning curve than we had, right? Not everyone should have to go through a 10 year long career in real estate to know how to invest. And that's kind of our goal. Yeah. Well, it's a great goal and it's really <laughs> great to have you here today. Mr. Heim, yes. I know you're, you're, you know, never at a loss for words. Well, <laughs> I, I want to thank you for inviting me to Battle of the More Network Star. You know, you're roughly my yeah, age. Know. Vince is older. They're much younger. <laughs> um, we used to watch that this show as a kid. They get all the n three networks. There were only three then. And, you know, they would all have relay races and I everything. I used to watch that. That was amazing. <laughs> we're we're going to do this, apparently. I've been talking to my good friend Ray about the, we're going to have teleprompter reading. <laughs> you know, interviewing, we're going to have all this because physical stuff. No, I'm not doing anything. And, and, and Good luck, you Mr. know, Ray. It, it, it's it's also, you know, your your show is interesting because you kind of meld your personal life with your business life. Right. That's, you know, you talk about each one of our shows and it's all a reflection of us personally, the things that we care about. I had someone ask me, you know, this all started during the pandemic. I think I wrote I started writing the blog in July of 2020. Ironically, the first episode, the first issue, the main story was mortgage rates dip below 3% for the first time ever. That was probably wow. the beginning of the end of the real estate market, by the way. Well, you know, so uh, but somebody had asked me, because the blog has been very successful. We have over 2,500 readers each week, which is scary that that many people are reading it. Especially um, since you write it. I, I, I didn't like to have that much power. But somebody asked me, like, how do you have a successful blog or a podcast? And I said, the only way to stand out is to make it about you. If you try to be somebody else or you're just trying to keep it bland, you know, it's like a, a musical artist trying to write songs that other people will like instead of just writing what they feel. So, yes, I like to inject humor. We like to inject sports. I like mm -hmm. to make fun of the Mets every chance I get. Uh, it's an easy target. We like, to, we like to have interesting stories that, you know, cross over, so to speak, uh, like our annual uh, report on Bobby Bonilla Day. <laughs> I, I'll save that. Now I can do a podcast on it. It's going to be a lot more fun. But it actually does involve Bernie Madoff, if you can believe that, if you've never heard the story. So it, it's been great to do the podcast. You were there when, it, when it, it started. We were having a director's meeting, and our CEO, Bess Freeman, said, Greggy, why aren't you doing a podcast? <laughs> I said, nobody's asked me to do a podcast. Well, now you're doing one, and uh, we just did our 18th episode. And we haven't been canceled yet. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> so 18 episodes of podcast. How many reports are you issuing each month? Well, you forget each month. Each week we do four reports, the blog, the podcast, monthly inventory, rental reports, two rental reports each month. 
quarterly reports for all areas of New York City, townhouse reports. And, you know, there are a couple thousand brokers in the company that need assistance with things. So what would VHS do without Greg Heim, right? Let, let's hope they don't find out until I'm ready to retire. <laughs> uh, but, exactly. it's, you know, I've been here 20 and a half years now, uh, to be precise, since I'm an economist. I've known you for almost 30 years. You know, That's working right. at Rebney for eight years before I came here uh, made it a very easy transition. Yeah. And uh, I never, I didn't want to, when they first approached me about writing the blog, I'm like, another thing to do? And then I realized that it was fun. You know, some weeks you are you get an employment report in your lap or something really funny happens. And, and then some weeks you got nothing. And you're like, how am I going to get 2,500 people to read this? So you try to find a way. You just keep that issue really short. So, <laughs> but, you know, I, I one people of the things. People don't read in this trick. business. You're right. One of the things, you know, I, I know that Vince, for some reason, said nice things about you. But I have to say nice things about Vince because doing his podcast a couple of times, uh, you know, got me exposed to it so I sort of knew what to expect you know we don't do guests every time you know it, it's it's um, it depends on economic news you know if sure. I'm going to spend there's employment reports and inflation reports we want to dig into I don't want someone just sitting there you know getting bored or feeling shy to jump well it's in, easy so. to get bored sometimes watching your show but you know <laughs> Maybe if it goes over your head. But, uh. <laughs> well, that's not really hard. I'm a little shorter than you. So, uh, Candace and Melissa, speak, speaking about guests, I know sometimes you have guests on your show. Sometimes, you know, you, you, you have just, not just the two of you, but the two of you. How do you decide what guests to, to have? And, and particularly, I know, you know, you have your, your network of, of professional women as well. So how do you meld that into your, into your podcast? I think for us, we sort of decide, you know, what kind of topic we want to talk about. And of course, we go to the experts in that, right? So for example, we had, we wanted to talk about Opportunity Zone. And so we had a guest who is also in sports, but he's doing so much revitalization of, you know, California. So we wanted him to be on the show and he has a really dynamic background. So we kind of have the topic first and then we look for our guests. Yeah. Just to add to that, sorry, we're sharing a mic here, so it's a little. Um, to add to that, you know, we did found Tower, which stands for the Organization by mm. Women in Real Estate, and that's kind of the brainchild of where the podcast came out of. And so we've really built a, a great network that we're very happy and proud to be a part of, of you know, of other professional, you know, investors, um, and many of whom are women. So it's not exclusive to women, but um, you know, it definitely we do like to put an emphasis on that as being, you know, women founders and knowing that sometimes it is a little bit you know more difficult coming into certain rooms as a woman you know in real estate so um, we just really want to empower everyone and, and again tapping into that network has helped us pull pull our guests yeah well I, I think that's terrific and I think that, that that what you've done with your with your network with your organization you know to bring that all to the table and and run a successful real yes. estate brokerage business at the same time is is, is amazing and you two are a quite the dynamic duo. Yeah. Thank you. And that's what, we, you know, we were just talking about. It feels like these days, you know, with how hard our, our job is as brokers and agents, it's like you have to have, you can't just be a broker anymore, right? You <clears> now <throat> need a podcast, you need a brand, you need social media, you need so many things now to really stand out. But it's all in the service of our clients. Are you trying to figure out ways to add more value to your client? You know, just like what, you know, the every day of our jobs is no longer enough to stand out and really, um, you know, build your career. So it's really kind of pushed us all to figure out, you know, the next phase of, yeah. of I mean, you've been there for a while, but for some of us newer ones, you know, to figure out how no, to do it. But you still yeah. have to do it all the time, every day, every day. Branding is so important to Super. keep it going all the time. Yeah. So Vince, be, being the senior podcaster in the room, <laughs> how... I feel old. <laughs> uh, you're very young. Is, is, is it warm and enough in the studio for you? Yeah, you're still young and very handsome. So, oh, thank you. so how has your show impacted your business? It, it, it's interesting because sometimes it does greatly and sometimes it doesn't. Um, it, it, it really depends on market uh, and it depends on how much I put into the branding, as, as mm -hmm. Candace and Melissa was saying, and how much I, I post on social media. It gets a lot of attention. I get a lot of attention because of it. Now, does it always turn into business? Not always. Like this week, I've gotten three uh, inquiries based on some show wow. postings. That's amazing. Well, and let's see where it ends, mm -hmm. right? So I don't really know. Uh, but it, it, it does impact. But for the most part, I think I agree with, with the, what they said. You know, in this business, it's more than just, you know, uh, 
what we do every day transactionally. It's it's more about getting your name out there, branding yourself, making people out there know that you can be or are the expert in the real estate profession. And if they need something, they'll come and call on you. And you know, same thing with email blast. You know, I put the show out in blast. I put my listings out in blast, and people respond. Yeah. So we have to keep up with a very difficult sometimes business that we you know all look, know and love, but you know. It's trying sometimes. A- absolutely. And and you start your show almost always with some economic news yeah. and news updates, right? So not all the news is always positive. No. Do you ever shy away from a topic because the news isn't, to- no. isn't positive? Or is it just, you know, whatever's going on now, let's talk about it and be open and honest You know, that's it. a really good question, Steve. And, um, you know, I, have, I purposely don't shy away from stuff that may be a little controversial. I'm not, you know, I don't bring politics into it. I don't bring my opinion into it. I strictly read the news, whether it's a good story or, or a not so good story. Uh, Greg here, you know, gives me incredible reports, all of us actually here at Brown Harris. So I take a lot of that, you know, consumer information or numbers information um, uh, data uh, and use that. But no, as far as the news uh, items are concerned, um, I don't want to be partial. I just, you know, if something is out there, something is out there, right? Yesterday or the day before, I can't remember the days anymore, but yesterday, <laughs> I think, I reported on Apple and, and the iPhone, you know, and the Department of Justice, mm-hmm. you know, uh, coming down hard on, on the Apple Corporation. And we can't live without our phones, right? Mm-hmm. So some people are going to receive that well, and some people are going to say, hey, you know, what's that about? Yeah. It's all in the it's all in a day, and I try and keep the news piece to like the very end. Like I start writing the show on Thursday for the following week, I might not do the news piece until Sunday or Monday, to be current. Yeah, so that's, that makes that's very similar to our show as yeah. well. We do have a headline, and that's a very interesting question because for us, I always pause right when we're doing it. Um, I was a journalist before, so I kind of have. Yay. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> ringers. Ringers, ringers, right? <laughs> well, speaking yes. of a pause, I don't mean to cut everyone off. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back shortly. What do you really need to know about buying or selling a home? First, it's serious business. And it's complicated. There's a lot of money on the table, and emotion too. You need an agent who knows the ropes. So, whether you're buying or selling your home, work with professionals who have a mastery of the craft. All right, and we're back. So for the next segment, I really want to talk about what we just saw in the first quarter of the market and where we think the market's going in the future. I know no one has a complete crystal ball other than Greg, who could be right 50% of the time. Um, but you know, let's, let's talk about that. So Greg, start us off. What did we see in the first quarter and what do you think that shows for the next quarter or two? Well, it wasn't a great first quarter. I don't think there's any sugar coating it. You talk- how, how do you qualify great? Well, look at it this way, you know, contract activity, was about where it was a year ago, and the first quarter of last year was terrible. Okay. So th- I guess that's, <laughs> that's you know, you talk about you shying go. away from news. I mean, one of, the, one of the fun parts about my job is people are expecting me to talk about it. You know, a lot of times I, when we used to do sales meetings in person all the time, people would always say, you got good news today. And I go, sorry, I don't take requests. <laughs> like, well, we'll talk about what there is to talk about, and I'll tell you what you need to know. I, I look. We had a lot of momentum coming into this year. Rates fell a percent in November and December. Uh, We had a lot of inventory. That was good. That keeps things flowing. You know, our levels of inventory, other parts of the country would kill for. Uh, But then one, you know, all of a sudden we realized, wait, the economy is doing a lot better than we thought. Look at the fourth quarter GDP number. That's that's insane. We're we're still adding almost 300,000 jobs a month. The unemployment rate is still below four. Hello. Then you know that. Then the expectation for inflation goes up, and ten-year treasuries follow, and mortgage rates go up. Right. But but as an economist, how 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 do you how do you justify and take a look at that? Because if the economy is doing well and people are spending money, then there is going to be likely inflation, right? I mean, no one wants to see the value of their home go down, but everyone's complaining that home home prices are too high. So right. as an economist, how do you look at that and how do you justify the, the, well, the home, news out there? Home prices are the biggest driver of inflation because you think about, you know, because those indexes are weighted and you spend more on housing than anything else. In fact, last month, housing and gas prices were 60% of the inflation. Number. Exactly. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think that, you know, Vince asked this question one time, like if, if, the economy is going real fast. Why not keep rates low? You know, enables people to keep spending money. The problem is there's what 
we used to call it comeuppance. You know, <laughs> there's a price to pay for that. During COVID, we we had to send checks to people because people couldn't work, and then we kept sending more checks, and then we sent some more checks. Next thing you know, the money supply has increased by forty percent. That's never happened before, and you know, inflation's too much money chasing not enough goods. So. We, we had a combination of a 40% increase, unprecedented increase in the money supply with an unprecedented shortage in the supply chain, right? Because people weren't working, manufacturing right. stuff. Mm -hmm. that, that takes a lot of pain to get rid of. If you think about it, in the early 80s, Paul Volcker caused a recession on purpose because it was the only way to get only rid of inflation. To, right. And I say it all the time. I've said it on every other podcast, I've been say this one. <laughs> inflation is like termites in the house. You have to get rid of it. It is because it will destroy your economy if it's left unfixed. You know, it'd be nice to say, look, the value of everybody's homes, home is going up. That's great. But on the flip side, what are you going to do when you sell your home? Who's going to be able to afford it? Right. And I think that's what we're seeing now, being that credit card debt is over $1.1 trillion, you know, at very high rates. The consumer, which is 70% of our economy, is struggling you know, they're spending more on food. There's 30 percent of their disposable income is being sent, spent on food. That's the highest percent in 30 years. So I'm sorry, th they're spending the highest percent of, of their disposable income food in 30 years. Right. So that that says something. People are, you know, literally, you know, that's a kitchen table issue, right? <laughs> food. Yes. And the home or the, the apartment you rent. So to answer your question, I look. The economy is held up better. We want the soft landing. We don't want to go in a recession. We can't rule it out, but it's looking like it may happen. And and that surprises me and most economists. But I think that the number one thing you need is uh, at least a manageable level of inflation. Now, I think we'll get there. The question is, you know, when does the Fed cut rates? They're going to cut rates three more times. They have six more meetings. We dissected this on my <laughs> podcast this week, all the combinations. Maybe they do one in June to calm everybody down because everybody wants one and then do November and December because that would be after the election. But again, this stuff takes six months to work uh, at minimum. So I, I think managing all these pieces are hard because it's not just what the Fed does. It's what the federal government does. You know, right. there's fiscal policy and then there's monetary policy and sometimes they don't go they don't, together. They don't always well, fiscal, equate, right? uh, fiscal policy is about, you know, getting people to vote for you <laughs> as much as anything. <laughs> right. Especially in an election year. No right? matter who's in charge, yeah. you know, we're running up the debt by a trillion dollars every one hundred days. Yeah. And that's not sustainable. But wow. you know, when I when I was in economic school, you know, they they said if the government was running up huge debts, that would raise interest rates because you know, rates are the price of money. So if they're looking for money, we're looking for money, business is looking for money, rates would go up. But the last 30 years, it says that's not true because we've run unprecedented deficits. And right. So, so I, you know, I, I think we're headed in the right direction. I think it, the, the amazing thing is the labor market because all you hear is layoffs, 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 layoffs. But meanwhile, layoffs. unemployment or claims for unemployment, claims for unemployment go down. Are, are sitting near right. uh, almost near 200,000 on the nose. That's incredibly low. There are almost 9 million available jobs out there. The unemployment rate is under 4%. Under, uh, the, the biggest thing that we're missing is the labor force participation rate. We can't get enough people back into the labor force so we can see, uh, you know, more maximize our potential for growth. And, and that's really interesting because, you know, for instance, on, on some of the sites that we work on together, we see a lot of people moving into the city because they have a job and they want to be able to easily commute to their to their job, right? So Candace and Melissa, when, when, when you see this, right? So you hear, you know, there's inflation, people are confused. How do you consult your buyers and sellers? And and do you, do you I'm sure you tell them the same thing things, principles, because you're, you're very principled and moral people. But how, how do you justify the buyer who wants to buy in, the seller who wants the highest price, and both want a good deal? Yeah. <clears throat> it's like the story of our lives, right? <laughs> 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 Trying but you to can't make everybody happy all the time? <laughs> yeah, that's a can't. hard one. <laughs> that's literally why our job exists, right, is to be able to bring those two sides together. And, um, you know, in these times, it's much more difficult. I think we've just relied on a lot of education and some creative thinking. So one of just example that's helped us kind of bridge that gap is, you know, rate buy downs. It's something that your average buyer and even many brokers out there don't think about when a buyer's like, I can't offer anymore. I can't afford it at this point. And the seller's like, well, I'm not ready 
ready to discount. What's been really profound is that instead of just focusing on a discount on a price is using some of that savings, buying down your rate as low as you can. And that new mortgage payment is the equivalent of if you bought, you know, a property for significantly less. And so, you know, people sometimes don't know that. So and then you bring that to your client and they're suddenly like, okay, that makes sense. Now I can increase my offer more because I'm going to buy down my rate. And then you make a deal. And obviously that doesn't work every time, but it's just relying on, you know, strategies like that to try to bridge that gap. Yeah. Or, or sometimes you can even get the, the seller to agree to a concession right. so that the buyer can buy down their rate without it actually coming out of pocket. Because a lot of times it's not the monthly carry or even the purchase price of the home, but it's actually that cash down that makes it sometimes difficult for, for buyers to proceed. Exactly. You see that a lot more in our new developments. Uh, sellers don't, uh, of resale don't really understand the whole concession concept, yeah, but on the <laughs> new development, the sponsors, you know, are more f comfortable with that. And so, yeah, that, it's just strategies like that. And also there is a lot of cash deals in New York right now. You know, last quarter we had 70% cash, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was profound to us as well. So that's what kind of deals we're getting done. We're seeing foreign investment as well, which are not coming in with the same pressures of our economy here, right? They're coming in from different economies in different markets. Markets. And so for them, it, this looks good, you know, or they have different motivators for why they're buying here. So, you know, it's not been easy, like you said, but we wouldn't be here if it was. Oh, so. it's, not, it's not an easy job and we yeah. wouldn't have one. Exactly. Vince, wh where do you see the market going this year based on your business, based on what you hear from your guests? Well, I think I, I agree with what Greg said. I think uh, last quarter and first quarter of this year, uh, fourth quarter of last year and first quarter have not been great. Uh, but I do see um, a lot more interest all of a sudden, an uptick in market activity, you know, whether it's new development, whether it's on the resale side. Uh, and I think a lot of it's going to happen, uh, as Greg indicated, when and if the, the rates start coming down. Buyers are actually sitting on the fence now waiting for that to happen. But knowing that it will happen, I think they're kind of starting to look again and get a little more excited again. Several inquiries this week between listing uh, appointments and, and buyers finally. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think that the cage has been rattled a little bit. We all know in New York City, you can't keep a buyer down for very long. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether yeah. it's a pandemic or mm -hmm. if it's a financial crisis. I mean, they'll sit on the fence for a little while. Eventually, that money's burning a hole in their pocket and they're right. going to spend it. A hundred percent. And they're going to spend it. And so I think they're getting to that boiling point now where they're thinking, all right, so... I've been sitting for a while. I got to do something. And it's all on the seller side. I just wanted to add one other thing that what Candace was saying. If you get in touch with great conversation and great data is terrific, but you got to get in touch also with their pain point. Why are they looking to sell? Why do they need to sell? You know, and, and if you can figure out what that's about, you can get them to maybe come down a little bit on pricing or be a lot more negotiable. So, so I see um, in the second half of the year being a lot better than uh, we've seen in the last two quarters, fourth and first of this year. Yeah, and I think we've seen a lot of pent up demand. You know, obviously, yeah. you know, the last year was a slower year yeah. absorption wise. And, and Greg, you mentioned at our meeting just before this that that inventories are actually up a little bit, right? So do you think that's, is that a good thing? Do, does anyone think that, that that's a good thing? I do because yeah. I think that that gives buyers the opportunity to compare and contrast yeah. property so that they can make a good decision. But from an economic standpoint, how, how do you see it? Well, I think that, again, you look at the rest of the country, you know, existing home sales have risen the last couple of months, but prices keep going up. You know, and if you want to know how bad the housing shortage is across the U.S., you know, rates can double in a year and prices still go up because right. there's no yeah. other alternative. The thing about our market here in New York that's been great is we didn't get too hot after we reopened from COVID because we had a lot of inventory, it kept prices in check. So then when things slowed down again, prices didn't really fall. It's a, maintained a very tight range yeah. for, for almost four years now. So I, I, I think having the inventory forces sellers to be reasonable and it gives buyers options. You know, you'd want a little more urgency in the buyers to get things going it a little bit. It would be nice. <laughs> but I, I think I think that could be coming. And, and I know that I keep hearing from brokers, and Melissa, yeah. you probably hear this all the time. You know, they're starting to accept the new normal, right? right. I mean, yeah. uh, of interest rates. Yep. Right. Yeah, and I think too, you know, talking about cash deals, I think a lot of buyers now, they have that psychology that they know the rates are gonna come down, right? That's why we saw like an influx of buyers at the beginning of the year, but then it kind of froze and it became very yep. stagnant. But now they know that rates are gonna come down and people who have cash 
I, I've been reading the line, Greg, so I know that there's $33 billion. 33.8. <laughs> right? Um, Point eight billion is so, a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of cash out there, and I think people are now, who has that cash, they're now thinking, okay, I'm going to buy now and refinance, right? So mm-hmm. that then they don't have to compete with all that demand of buyers coming in. Yeah. Um, we've seen that a lot. You know, we've done a lot yeah. of cash deals, so that's kind of the sentiment there. But in terms of inventory, there's a lot, but there's not a lot of quality inventory. That's right? a good point. I've I've never heard a market uh, where a broker hasn't said that though. <laughs> it's always, but it's like, true. There's five thousand so apartments yeah. for sale. Yeah. Nobody wants any right. of those. Well, over- well, but there's also what I consider to be real inventory right. and yeah. aspirational inventory. Yeah, right. right there's the stuff that's like 20, 25 percent overpriced, right. even in the hottest market. Right. And is that real inventory? You know, to me, that's not real inventory. That's if I get an offer, if it works out, I'll right. sell. But I have no, as, as you were mentioning earlier, Vince, I have no motivation to right. sell, mm-hmm. right? Exactly I don't need right. to sell. I don't have a life event, right? right? So I, I think nice. that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. And also, no one's really building with the cost of construction, plus with the the lack of the failure of 421A, there's really no new inventory in terms of new development. Right. No, I, I mean, I've, I've been talking and I spoke to a developer early this morning. Any developer that is planning something now for two to three years from now is going to be in great shape because they will be one of the few games in town for new inventory. And, you know, the pipeline right now is less than 3,000 units in Manhattan, less than 2,000 units in Brooklyn. So, you know, something's going to give, but then again, that's going to cause higher prices again if if inventory is low. Well, and, you know, we recently got the uh, housing and vacancy survey that the city has done every couple of years by the Census Bureau. The vacancy rate for rental housing in New York City is 1.4%. So clearly there's not enough rental product. Yeah. <clears throat> there's not, look, there aren't too many places in this country that could say we have too much housing, you know, like, <laughs> because it is expensive. You know, when, when rates go up for us, they go up for builders too, you know, the cost of money and materials. It, and that that's part of the problem. The good news is that permits and housing starts were up last month. Uh, builder confidence is the highest it's been since yeah. last summer. So they're starting to ramp up. The uh, problem though, on a national basis is Single family homes are the most bought homes, right? Here in Manhattan, that's not true. But right, uh, but nationally, sure. But, you know, and now if I'm a buyer in most of the rest of the country, I'm competing with hedge funds, which are buying hundreds of well, thousands. They're, buying, because, yeah. 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 And, they're and, renting them out, right. but still, I, maybe I want to buy one and I don't want to compete with some right. of these firms. And they're not going to be selling them. That's a long-term hold. That's not a short-term they're business They're building plan. communities right. now. Right. I keep using the Oppenheimer reference because yeah. that's what they're yeah. doing. Yeah. They're, they're, they're building communities. They're also building communities for VRBO and Airbnb. You know, yeah. So these homes are never going to hit the for sale market. They're always going to yeah. be in the rental pool in one way or another. Yeah. They're priced out. Yeah. Who's going to compete with BlackRock, right? Like one of these big corporations. You, you can't. There's, we'll there's see how much I got cash. on me. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. Yeah. Well, well right. this has been really, really fun. I think we should do this every couple of months, actually. Right. Because, Wait, you on, know, on your podcast? On, well, we can or, rotate uh, podcasts, actually. Yeah, I don't, I'm don't. i happy to share. You know, absolutely. next time I do this with everybody, I'll have a mug, though. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, that's, cheers well, to that. I want to thank yes. you all. Congratulations on your 10-year anniversary. Congrats. You really are incredible, Vince, and you've been an inspiration for all of us. So I really want to thank you. I appreciate that. Well, thank you all. We look forward to seeing you next time and have a great day.